right. Are we live? All right, I think we are live. Hello, everybody. I'm just going to check a couple of things. I uh, logged in a minute or so early just to uh, make sure that all the tech stuff is working. Um, but hello! So feel free, if you're catching this video now, feel free to um, like it, love it, start commenting. Um, let me know that you're seeing this. That way um, I know that I'm not just simply talking into the void, so to speak. But um, but hello everybody. Okay, so we are live on the Facebook event page. That's awesome. And I believe this should be going on the Heart of the Story page as well. Yes. All right. How's everybody doing tonight, by the way? Well, it is seven o'clock, so welcome everybody. Um, so this is the um, quarterly poetry reading, um, I shouldn't say series, but this is the next quarterly poetry reading that I'm doing um, in celebration of Earth Day. It is Wednesday, April 26th at 7 p.m. Eastern. And um, yeah, I started doing these readings during the pandemic. Um, mostly just because I was looking to bring some, I wanted to bring some joy and happiness to people um, at what was a very difficult time for so many of us. And um, and we've been going ever since. And so, um, so I'm very thankful for that. And um, also to everybody who continues to tune in for these. So, um, as I said before, if you're seeing this video, feel free to say hello, um, to share comments. Um, for some reason, I'm not seeing any comments at the moment, um, even though it's saying that there are. Um, oh, there they are. <laughs> Hi, Aunt Sue. Hi, Sonia. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, so, yeah. So, real quick, um, tonight's theme is... Earth Day. Earth Day was on Saturday, and it's a day that's meant to bring awareness to not just the natural world, but to um, all of the impacts that our planet is um, experiencing, for lack of a better term, because of uh, climate change and other environmental crises. Um, so, yes, there will be some more. Ser there will be a few serious poems that deal directly with the environmental crisis side of things, but there are also going to be um, some more celebratory poems about nature as well. Um, now, um, before we get started with the reading, just a quick reminder that if you would like to show, if you'd like to see more of these readings in the future, and if you'd like to, you know, and to show some support for tonight's event, um, in the description for this video, you will find links to three different places where you can send a voluntary donation. You can use Coffee, Venmo, or PayPal. So if you would like to send in a, it's sort of a virtual pass the hat kind of thing. Um, so if you would like to um, send in a few dollars, whatever works for you, whatever is comfortable for you, um, I would greatly appreciate it. And again, it will just go toward um, the planning of the next reading, um, which may be sometime this summer. Um, and if you would prefer not to do um, virtual donations, so to speak, send me a message, um, email, um, direct message here on Facebook, and we can, I'd be happy to arrange another method, maybe um, check donation that you can mail, uh, that you can mail to me, uh, whatever works for you. All right? Well, I think with that being said, let's begin the, with the poems, right? So, and the fun thing about preparing for this reading was um, I got to 
go back to some poems that I haven't read in a long time and also to a couple poems that I don't think I've ever read before for an open mic or it's been a very long time since I've read it for an open mic or a reading. So we're going to kick off with Great Egret in Central Park. They say one should expect the unexpected in New York City. Perhaps they mean the subway violinists, the assailant pigeons, or the lost dollar bills sprouting out of asphalt. But no one ever said to expect you, the white duchess of waiting birds. I admit the grackles, those iridescent black and blue thieves, don't surprise me, nor do the mallards and the wood thrushes. Yet here you are treading the edge of the pond as if it's a path you've walked thousands of times. Your black spindle legs draw step after careful step. Your sinuous neck angles low as you scan the water, head poised with the knife of your bill. Could you teach me how to fish with your still water patience, or how to stand so still that my limbs turn into cattails? How is it that you and your self-assured stroll have become the center of my morning? Moments ago, car horns were baying, jackhammers clattering, and the five million footsteps falling citywide a constant hum. Now, there was only you and me and a countryside quiet that reminds me of the weed I found last night green and growing through the crack in a sidewalk. Do you mind if I sit here a little longer just to watch the miracle that is you? Here's another one that I haven't read in a long time. And nature is not just about animals and uh, plants we know. It's also about weather. So this one is fog rolling in from Oyster Pond. Now it creeps in from the pond toward the shore, so leisurely that it eludes the naked eye. Only ten minutes ago it posed a faint and silvery threat as it hovered above the gentle waves and the marina's empty boats. Now it crawls across the abandoned beach, slithering at a patient pace, swallowing each cum crumb of the coastal terrain, the water's edge, the grains of sand, the thick heads of marsh grass, the vacant parking lot and outhouse, the weathered and food-stained picnic tables, the neatly trimmed rose bushes and hydrangea, and finally Queen Anne Road and the intrepid cars on her tongue. Now this elbow of land is a wraith, a turbid shroud that's wider than the great egrets who mate here in the summer. So pale yet so bright that you might swear a swarm of ghosts is approaching, then lose your footing and your breath. Now you cannot help but gaze at the softly blinding wall cannot help but marvel at how the sky has lowered itself to the earth, how the teeth of mist don't bite, but rather graze your skin in cool, sweet beads, how the embrace of its milky arms is more tender than the smothering you expected, how you subscribe to sightlessness for a moment so you can say you've touched the clouds. I guess I can't really go, um, I can't really do a poetry reading without reading at least one poem inspired by my trips to Iceland. This is Riding a Horse in Iceland. You have to trust the horse. It will know what to do as you ride. The instructor doesn't say this, but the way she mimics how to sit in the saddle and her gentle hints as she describes the differences between a trot and a tolt 
say just as much. I take her advice and dress myself in it, along with the rented helmet and boots, the, glove I bar the gloves I borrowed from a friend, and my courage. I might not be afraid of horses, but learning how to ride one at age 34 can still pitch your heart into your throat. Outside, the horses wait for us, calm, almost sleepy in the early April chill. I learn my new friend's name, Aphrodita, a piebald beauty standing five feet tall, three inches shorter than me, when holding her head high, her winter fur molting off in pouches. She can be a bit headstrong, the instructor warns. She likes to ride at the front. But the horse shows no sign of impatience as I stroke her mane and back. Instead, she embraces me, bending her neck so I'm between her shoulder and her head. She remains calm as I struggle to swing my leg around to sit astride her, as I correct my posture and the grip on the reins, as I hang back so we're in the middle of the pack when we walk out of the pen. Am I ready to be at the front, I ask myself? Soon enough, Aphrodita answers for me, weaving around our companions and striding into the lead, the bounce of her body and the muscles in her abdomen shaking me, shifting my center of gravity. My chest clenches at her quiet insistence, but I don't question it now that I see what she wants me to see the lava fields that are both maze and playground. Every step up, down, and around on our tour, she gestures with her head as if to tell me, look at the towers of rock around us, crusted with basaltic black but brick red underneath. Look at the lichen, that velvet chartreuse, the grass, dry and long as hair, shining gold in the daylight the islands of snow and the ponds they create when they melt. Look at the mountains that meet the sky to the north, south, and east, and the pillars of hotels and church steeples to the west. Can you believe we're still in Reykjavik? And look at the steep rise in our path, narrowed by boulders, and how the world opens wide as we crest it. Do you see how your face glows in the, with, from the cool wind, the defiant sun, and the taste of adventure. Do you see it? Yes, Aphrodita, I whisper breathlessly. Yes, I see it all. So just so it's clear, um, the way that I've this is set up on Facebook, um, I cannot see it when people are commenting, but feel free to, if you are commenting, continue to comment, say hello, let me know which poems you like, which lines really stand out to you, any reactions you may have, um, like and love the video, share it, um, because we're just going to roll right along into um, the next poem. And that is, so this next one is a fairly new poem. Um, Massachusetts had a very, had an pretty awful drought um, over the summer. It was very, very hot and we saw almost no rain and um, we were not the only place that uh, experienced this kind of summer. Um, so this is called Letter to Mother Earth During a Severe Drought. Massachusetts, Summer 2022. Earth under my feet, tell me. Do you remember the last time it rained? It's the middle of August, and since the spring equinox, showers and thunderstorms have rolled through so rarely that when they do, I swear the torrents, the puddles, the slick pavement, the pearls of moisture clinging to leaves and daylily petals are all a mirage. By day's end, the asphalt is once again a black desert and the ground is barely wet to the touch because you have gulped down every last drop. When I step outside, even my eyes feel parched. That is how thirsty you have become, and I don't blame you. 
if I had no choice but to drink only a drop of water each week because that was all I was given, I would hoard each deluge whenever it came. I would be selective about who to share my windfall with, even if it meant browning the grass to a crisp and leaving the topsoil to bake into dust, just so the hydrangea blossoms could blush and purple, just so this year's apples could swell with sweet flesh and juice, just so I could live. I need no reminders that you are not the greedy one. When I drive around town, I find sprinklers spitting and kiddie pools overflowing despite the water ban, as if we humans own this precious commodity when in reality, you need the relief more. You need it so much that you have resorted to swallowing rivers. It's breaking news now. People are walking across shallows in the Loire in France, the Po in Italy, the Danube in Romania, the Charles here in Massachusetts. Last night, while out for a walk, I stopped at the brook limping past my street. The water level was so low that you were exposed. A rise at the bottom of the brook's muddy bed, surfacing like a whale before its breath geysers out. But this was not an ocean, and you are not a whale. And scientists say this may be the norm in the years to come. Summer after summer of hot, rainless summer, until even the taps from our faucets trickle to a crawl, until those blessed drip, drip, drips are gone. This next poem, to go back to the lighter side of things a little bit, um, was requested by Sonia. So Sonia, this is the spider. The spider knows what she is doing when she picks the exact place where she'll spin her web. She builds her home herself using her body and the silk she creates. She needs no help, no instruction. The spider does not hurry her construction. She knows her work is painstaking, that it takes time to form what will sustain her. Her shelter, her invention, is a product of her intuition, connecting her to branches, rafters, blades of grass, and dead flowers. The spider sees in many ways. Her eyes, the sensitive hairs on her legs, the dainty plucking of strands on her web. This helps her determine whether the fibers need reinforcement. A potential mate has come to visit, or her fly has been trapped for her next meal. The spider means no harm. If you find her in your house, invite her to stay and feed on the flies that pester and the mosquitoes that bite. If she prefers your backyard, let her live there instead. Her feet will not absorb pesticides into her bloodstream, and she will crawl to a safer tree. Whatever you do, do not remove the spider from your world. If her kind were to vanish, other insect populations and their diseases would multiply. She cannot afford to be lost to legend, found only in the stories of the weaver Arachne the trickster Anansi, or the Cherokee grandmother, the light bringer. So when you see the spider on your wall or the frame of her web on your porch, ask yourself if it's necessary to kill her, if it's necessary to wipe that corner clear with a broom when you know she will only come back to rebuild it. This next poem is a very timely poem in that um, the state of Massachusetts um, on Mondays, I don't want to say celebrated, but they commemorated the first right whale day. Um, North Atlantic right whales are very much endangered. There are only about 350 of these whales left in the world and at 
based on a news report I read earlier this week, um, only 70 of those whales are actively re reproducing females. Um, they have a, a good, they've had a good number of calf births so far this year, I think about 12 or 13, um, but they're still dying off at a rate faster than they're reproducing. And so anything that can be done to help save these whales, um, are, those are measures that we really do need to take. Um, or else we risk the chance of seeing these whales disappear in our lifetime. So with that, here is Lament of the North Atlantic Right Whale. I didn't conceive a calf this year, nor did the other females in my pod. If you could understand our language, our moaning, pulsing songs, you would know that every summer in the Bay of Fundy, we strain fewer and fewer zooplankton and krill through the sieves of our mouths, and not because our own numbers are growing. My mother, bless her shore-stranded soul, once spoke of how these northern waters used to be colder, cleaner, quieter. Now they're thick with sewage, oil, and fuel, and congested with ships that slice the surface like predators. They don't eat us, but they've killed 20 of our kind in the past two years with the knuckles of their hulls, the spinning teeth of their propellers, and the fingers of fishing nets that scar our bodies. My youngest child drowned in one four springs ago. He wasn't even a year old when he strayed too close to the boat and the meshing slipped between his baleen plates. I could only watch as he wrestled with the net as it ensnared his head and fins, as blood streamed from the cuts in his storm gray skin, as eventually he stilled and closed his blowhole. I've had no children since then, and not for lack of trying. Sometimes I imagine he's nudging my side, or if I've rolled onto my back, he's nestled between my flippers. His weight was an ocean of comfort, the callosities on his nose and jaw as beautiful as the shimmer of moonlight through the sea at night. There was another story my mother told me once, how many years ago our unhurried pace and coastal wanderings would catch the attention of land-dwelling harpoon-limbed hunters who would later alchemize our deaths into gold by boiling our blubber to harvest its oil. Those pursuits have ended as far as I've been told, but sometimes I wonder if we are still being hunted. All right, so I'm gonna make some adjustments because as always, these readings tend to go a little bit faster than I think they will. Um, I'm gonna skip over the next poem I have planned and go right to Osprey at Bass River, another one I haven't read in a long time. Look at how it stands tall at its nest, a watchful sentry, quiet until it opens its black hooked beak and chirps its kettle whistle call. When it alights, the thrash of its wings is palpable, a heartbeat in my ear. And look how it flies with its brown wings bowed, its primary feathers splayed like fingers, its white crown and vest on full display. Its golden eyes fix upon the water below before it hovers briefly, but patiently, then dives cliff steep, feet first, shattering the surface with a splash. And as it rows itself upright, climbs into the air with a fish in its talons, its poise does not falter, and the tempo of its flight, a keen and vicious pulse, does not slow. This hunt, this knowing that something is about to die, should make me flinch. And yet the act is so graceful, so flawless, that I cannot look away. How does such a thing exist? A raptor that is wilder than a dream does not frighten me. 
but rather swoops into view and snatches my breath the way it would snatch its prey. Then again, the world is bursting with contradiction. Darkness cannot be without light, love without hate, death without light. And here is this king of the river, this artful thief, taking what it needs to survive and leaving a gift in its wake. So this next poem is another one that was inspired by a trip to Iceland um, and one I haven't had the opportunity to read very much and this felt like an appropriate time to read it tonight. Um, during this trip, it was back in September of 2021, um, I had the opportunity to see um, the glacier that this poem is about um, and it was the most gorgeous day of the trip. Um, perfect weather, which in Iceland it tends to um, rain a lot and be quite cloudy, but on this day it was 60 degrees Fahrenheit. It was very few clouds in the sky and we had such an incredible view of um, Snæfells Jökull Glacier. Um, and this is a glacier that's located about two, two and a half hours north of Reykjavik. Now, early on the trip, um, another piece of this puzzle, uh, puzzle for this poem fell into place where we went to a, um, sorry, lost my train of thought. We went to um, a museum that, uh, among other things, had a, um, an exhibit about glaciers, and including how glaciers are being affected by global warming. And after doing some research, this was the poem that I came up with. Elegy for Snæfell's Jökull Glacier. And it kicks off with a, um, an epigraph from Icelandic author Andri Snæir Magnusson. For a 2019 plaque he wrote to commemorate the loss of the Icelandic glacier Akjökull. Uh, These Icelandic pronunciations. <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. He wrote, Ak is the first Icelandic glacier to lose its status as a glacier. In the next 200 years, all our glaciers are expected to follow the same path. This monument is to acknowledge that we know what is happening and what needs to be done. Only you know if we did it. Snæfell's Nest Peninsula, Iceland, September 2021. You will likely die before I die. I was not thinking of this when I was standing in the black gravel pull-off along Route 574, pressing the smartphone's cam camera's button every few seconds in case the previous photo was blurry. In that moment, you were making an appearance, cooperating with the cloudless lakes, late summer sky and shifting your volcano's lenticular scarf to the right so I could see you. White as an arctic fox in winter, your body of ice was dense and seemingly stationary. Later, upon checking my photos, I discovered that your crevasses and river waves, the details I had seen with the naked eye and hoped to capture by zooming in, were almost invisible. Instead, the black necks of Ravalok protruding from your summit bade me not to look away. These rocks are ill omens, I've been told. They were first sighted nine years ago because you are melting. There is no end I can conceive for myself that can equal the agony of yours. Dissolving from the fluid, frozen state you reveled in for 700,000 years, down to the sickly four square miles that are left, growing thinner and thinner until you are too frail to flow, while watching your sisters in Iceland and beyond disintegrate in the same way. All the while, you're sitting with the creeping knowledge that the world will one day be an enormous jokelhop, those glacial dam bursts you know so well, swallowing shorelines flooding coastal homes and businesses, displacing and drowning their residents, 
depriving us of the many gifts you and your siblings share with us, like irrigation and fertile soil for our crops, fresh water for our thirst, cold air to balance our climate. I wish I could hold you out of comfort, tell you that the future might not be so bad, but what would make your passing worse? The lie to ease your pain or the tender, or the tender well-intended gesture? The warmth I create, not with my heart, but with my hands, my car, my electricity, is only bringing your eviction date closer. I am 37 years old, and if the estimates hold true, you will likely die before I die. And now I know that the rivulets and waterfalls I spotted while driving along the peninsula's coast are not meltwater, but the tear streams of a grandmother crying her last. It's 7.30. I have one more poem to read, um, if that's okay with the rest of you. I, I did not want to leave this reading on too much of a downbeat note. As much as some of the things that the more um, climate or environmental crises poems express are true, I still wanted to end things on a high note a little bit. Um, so just a quick reminder um, before I read the last poem. Again, if you, um, you know, feel free to like and love this video, share comments if you haven't yet. I will catch up on the comments in a little bit once the, vid once the reading is done. Um, I am also accepting um, past the hat donations once again through Coffee, Venmo, and PayPal. So if you would like to contribute and show your support of this reading and, um, and also for, the, for future readings that will happen here, um, just click any of those links. They should be in the description for um, this video and uh, feel free to submit uh, an amount that's comfortable for you. And if you would prefer not to do that, uh, feel free to reach out to me by email, text message, or direct message here on Facebook, um, and maybe we can come up with an alternate, uh, an alternate blah, 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 um, payment method um, if you want to, um, if you would like to contribute. Um, and with that being said, here's the last poem of the night. A nice short one. Twilight in April. The pond is on fire tonight. The shadows swallowing oaks and pines into dusk are such a radiant black that they almost gleam gold. Vermilions serenade ambers, indigos, and lavenders. And though the clouds are wisping, the water resting, and the bird songs diminishing, the world has reached a coda, a reminder that it is always waking, always rousing, and perhaps too candescent to know how to sleep. Thank you so much, everybody who uh, watched the live, uh, the live edition of this reading. Um, I hope you enjoyed the set of poems I shared with you. Um, and, um, and I hope it also just brought a little bit more awareness to um, the beauty of our, of the natural world and also the ways in which it still really desperately needs our help and love. Um, so again, feel free to like and love this video, um, share it with your friends, um, and, uh, we've are, uh, and also to send in your donations through any of the channels that I mentioned earlier. Um, and, um, Maybe we can do this again sometime in the summer, maybe in July. I don't know. That's what my intuition is telling me. Um, if that is something you are interested in, because if you want to see more, please let me know, because that's what keeps these readings going is you, all of you who are watching. So either live or on the replay or on YouTube when I find when I get that up either later this week or next week. So. Thank you again, and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Bye.